Good afternoon. Thank you for coming today to Community Science in the Environmental Justice Act, Deinstitutionalizing de University Research. I am Michelle Oko, and I am a Senior Lecturing Fellow of Law with the Duke Environmental Law and Policy Clinic. Um, today we are here to address a very important issue, environmental justice and community research. Um, this is a huge move forward for a very long time in the environmental community. There has been a dichotomy between communities and environmental law. So right here we're at a point where those two considerations cannot be taken separately. There's a relationship that communities experience to the environment and there are unique communities that have to bear that burden more than other members of our society. And it's important that we address these issues. We've seen that movement. Um, tomorrow will be World Wildlife Day, and the theme this year is sustaining all life on Earth with the understanding that human beings are a very important aspect of our environment. So we are very, very fortunate today to have Omega and Brenda Wilson come to speak here with us today. They are the co-founders of the West End Revitalization Association, which was created in 1994 in Mebane, North Carolina, just 30 minutes down the road. And the mission of this organization is to support access to basic public amenities. That includes safe drinking water, sewer lines, housing, streets, sidewalks, and storm water management for people of color and marginalized communities. And the organization has dealt with federal administrative complaints. They filed these to have infrastructure installation under the Clean Air Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, Clean Water Act, RICRA, and other environmental laws so that they could get basic rights in their communities. The West End Revitalization Association supports primarily African American and Native American heritage communities. These include Weston, White Level, Kimry Road, Hawfields, all in Alamance County, and Buckhorn, Perry Hill, and Creeks Cross in Orange County. On February 1999 and September 2014, WERA filed complaints as the U.S. Department of Justice under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and referenced the Environmental Justice Executive Order 12898. To challenge the Plan 8 Lane Interstate Corridor that would destroy two African American and Native American communities in Mebane, North Carolina. DOJ directed six branches of the federal government to investigate their lack of oversight of civil rights and public health guidelines during the highway planning process that had begun for 16 years without opportunities for public input. The highway construction was placed on a moratorium from 1999 to 2016. More than 100 homeowners out of 500 have since had sewer lines installed for the first time and dirt streets have been paved. Even though homes within these homes did not have sewer lines, but they were within two blocks of Mebane's municipal sewer treatment plant. And that was since it was constructed in 1921. Omega served as the community perspective member of the EPA's National Environmental Justice Advisory Council from 2007 to 2010. The EPA publication Information to Action Strengthening EPA Citizen Science Partnerships for Environmental Protection features a case study on WERA community owned and managed research. Omega and Brenda served on the National Citizen Science City Side 2019 Conferences Environmental Justice Planning Committee from 2017 to 2019. In the, and in the AARP Bulletin of April 2019, both are featured as senior, cited, senior citizen scientists for collaborative problem solving that addresses human beings in the environment. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn over our conversation to Omega and Brenda Wilson. Can you please give them a round of applause?
Thank you uh, for that introduction, Michelle. My wife, uh, Brenda, and I would like to express sincere appreciation to Duke University's Environmental Law and Policy Clinic for inviting us here again, again, and again, and we hopefully <laughs> again. <laughs> Uh, we'd like to thank uh, co-director Reich Longus and Michelle Nolan and communications manager Clara Herman and also law fellow Michelle Okor. Uh, we also recognize and appreciate the opportunity to share environmental justice legacy space with Sherry White Williams, the former federal officer for EPA's Office of Environmental Justice. Uh, when I served as a community perspective member of EPA's National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, Sherry was there uh, with Roots from North Carolina, providing an opportunity for a bigger community voice uh, and words that shape us. Let's focus on three brief questions uh, to set the table for the topic <clears throat> of uh, this deinstitutionalizing university research why Community Science Supports the Environmental Justice Act. The first question is, what amendments should be made for more accountability and transparency when university relationships with adversely impacted communities like Mevin, like Durham, like Winston-Salem, North Carolina? Question two, what amendments should students and faculty make in career paths in order to improve accountability and transparency with your research in adversely impacted communities like Detroit, like Oakland, like Milwaukee, where the Democratic National Convention is going to be held this year, or like North Charleston. Third question, will you amend some of your law and policy education privileges to reduce the disparities, or will you continue to just study pain, suffering, and death in indigenous areas like the Lumbee of North Carolina, the Navajo, Puerto Rico, Alaskan indigenous communities, and Peru. Uh, just as the March of Washington in 1963 and Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream uh, words spurred passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, we trust that today's words at the luncheon, small group discussions, and later on the environmental justice class with Sherry White Williams this evening will help address uh, and encourage more support of citizen science, community science, community science, and passes an environmental justice act at the United States Congress. Allow me to take a few minutes to go through a brief history of amendments that kind of drives or puts the foundation of where we are now and so many things have not changed. Many refer to this as deconstructing racism. How many of you have heard that term before? All right, okay. Some of you refer to it as overcoming the old South. Some of you have heard that term before. And some of you refer, some of you refer to it as reversing revisionism. How many of you have ever heard that? Right, okay, and also Title IX. Ratification of the United States Congress, uh, United States, ratification by the United States Congress in 1865 uh, included the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery in the United States. For the record, I believe that the 13th Amendment was a first explicit mention of the inhumane institution of slavery the first time in the Constitution after 300 years of slavery, all right? January of 1863, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation declaring all people uh, who held as slaves with any state or any territory of their state, that these people would, would, would wherefore shall be in rebellion against the United States and shall then, thenceforward, forever be free, all right? However, the Emancipation Proclamation did not end all this uh, humane institutional culture. Lincoln understood constitutional amendments would be necessary, and they must be adopted 
to abolish the numerous uh, discriminatory institutions that were built around slavery. People were free, but the institutions were still in place, basically is what I'm saying here. Okay. President Lincoln was assassinated. Before the 14th Amendment was passed, it was adopted in 1868. And that amendment included rights for free slaves. We're still moving forward. 100 years later, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 still did not and has not removed all the barriers. And we still face them today. We see it on the news all the time. The 15th Amendment granted more freedom for voting for men, former slave men only, not women. All right? That should hit a note. In 1870, discriminatory practices prevented people who were known to have African blood from voting, especially in the South. The Voting Rights Act of, eight, of, 19, of 1965, Voting Rights Act of 1965, did not and has not removed voting rights barriers under the 15th Amendment, as we see on the news and lawsuits in the state of North Carolina. In 19, the ni 1990, 1994, 1994, we're jumping. The United, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously ruled that the landmark civil rights case of Brown versus Topeka, Brown versus Education in Topeka, Kansas, uh, was unconstitutional. State-sanctioned segregation of public schools was a violation of the 14th Amendment. We go all the way back again, right? And a violation of the Constitution. In 2020, many black and brown people still suffer institutional discrimination and racism in public school colleges and universities. Most recently, the president of Wake Forest University, right here in North Carolina, prestigious internationally known school, is President Nathan Hatch, issued an apology for its role in slavery and it's benefiting from slavery after anonymous and racist emails were forwarded to faculty members just in 2019, just last year, just a few months ago, right? The University of North Carolina's university system and many universities still are battling this issue in courts over discriminatory practices in dormitories, universities, with faculty, and Confederate monuments. We know that well. It's all over the news. What kind of amendments are needed to deinstitutionalize de and democratize internationally recognized universities throughout the United States and, and other nations? What kind of amendments? What do we need to do? How do we need to address it? Community-based and led science is addressed as necessary to support implementation of the Environmental Justice Act and its companion bills, S-2236, and that's the Senate, and H.R., House of, House of Representatives 3923, that were introduced July 23rd, 2019. And they were introduced by United States Senator Cory Booker, Democrat from New Jersey, and Representative Raul Ruiz, who is a doc, medical doctor, Democrat from California. My wife and I were, uh, and one of our friends named Vincent Martin, I'll speak about a little bit later, were among the team who were asked to provide input for that deal, along with uh, a group of other environmental justice leaders from 2017 to 2019 for two years. The current political climate, however, at the highest congressional level, and political level reinforces the reality that institutional discrimination and the cultures around it continue to create new barriers for old laws being implemented and new laws to be adopted, like the Environmental Justice Act, like the climate change bills that are being proposed. Many of these barriers and obstacles come from very informed and very educated people like yourselves, or like your parents, or like your grandparents. We know that some of you come from, very, from some very well-set and prestigious homes. And some of your families and some of your friends 
may very much be involved in, in maintaining those cultural barriers. Uh, much of the institutional racism is maintained in colleges and universities, and it protects research practices and methodologies uh, that study brown and black people in the indigenous areas in their communities. This racially exploitive methodologies too often are nurtured by university administrators and faculty in order to keep their jobs, don't rock the boat, to leverage advance, advancement, I need a raise, or get tenure, I'm staying here forever, right, or publications. One of my colleagues at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, said that some of those publications, some of the articles are only read by three people. <laughs> uh, so um, in any case, Unfortunately, local grassroots organizations like the West End Revitalization Association still are confronted with students and faculty at various places in various parts of the country who still want to study our chronic pain, our suffering, uh, our lack of corrective action for civil rights and environmental justice, and identify us to be a part of their research project, to identify us as an opportunity to become a guinea pig a lab rat, a bar graph, a pie chart without name and identification to be only become a statistic. These are issues that our organization, the West End Revitalization Association, we've been dealing with since 1994. Uh, when we learned about the 119 bypass coming through our community, uh, we were looking for right to basic communities. And our community organization organized to address the issue because the planning process excluded the West End community, excluded African-American residents who were actually placed there out of slavery. They're living on the same land and built churches and houses and sometimes small business in the exact same spot, the exact same land, the exact same areas that they were placed off the plantation. Okay. Contractors who planned the 119 bypass corridor that would come through West End and White Level, it's already coming through West End. We made some modifications based, based on our civil rights complaints from years ago. Is designed under a process uh, from the Environmental Protection Agency based on what is called a National Environmental Policy Act of 1969. I think all of you know what that is, right? Okay. And of course, there's a process that comes out of it when you identify an area that you're going to do major development, highway corridors, other kinds of stuff to go building, uh, corporate development, uh, industrial development, we call it environmental impact statement that comes out of that, right? And we're going to do a pretty detailed uh, discussion with that with, with Sherry's class this, tonight. We have a PowerPoint specific to that to actually show a lot of pictures in our community about what's happening, what's happening, right? The engineers and scientists are very well trained. Some of you, some of your future, <laughs> some of your future might wind up being in these positions. But what we found out is hundreds of pages were printed with dozens and dozens of maps that minify, minimize the impact to our communities. They undercounted our houses, they undercounted our populations, and it was not by accident or out of ignorance. It was done because of the institutional problems we just talked about. Uh, we had backyard septic tanks, 50 to 100% failure rates, wasn't recorded. The highway construction would eliminate 87% of the houses, 87, the 87% of the property loss in the West End community would be African American historic property and churches, 87%. By the way, you already know that's against the law, it's illegal but it was documented and recorded and they were going to proceed. So in 1999, we filed a complaint, Title VI Civil Rights Act, that referenced the environmental justice uh, order. Uh, and of course that executive order was signed by President Bill Clinton at the strong encouragement of, of Al Gore, Al Gore is still working on that. He's still traveling all around the world with that mission in mind. So a lot of people didn't realize that that was his mission, his 
mission when he was uh, selected to be vice president, and that was one of the very first things that was uh, addressed when President uh, Clinton got in office because apparently that was a deal they made. So he, Clinton did an executive order. President Clinton did an executive order to do that. One of the things we found out in the process of our complaint from the, the justices in the uh, Office of Civil Rights for, for, uh, for uh, EPA, uh, for Department of Justice, rather, is they told us that um, what is happening in your community, you've been de denied basic amenities due to a historic pattern of racial discrimination by revisionist government. So what I said to you earlier was not based on feeling or historical research. It was based on what was told to us directly by the Department of Justice. Now, revisionists, by the way, does anybody know what a revisionist is? Do you know? Revisionists are people who are people like you, people like your mothers and fathers, who do not wear Klan uniforms. They do not harass people of color or women in public. But what they do do is chip away. If they're a doctor, you may not get the treatment you need. If they're a mechanic, your oil right, might not be changed just right or the right kind. Or you might not get your tires balanced even though you paid for it. Those are revisionists. If you're a military officer, you may find a way to mistreat women officers. You mistreat uh, Hispanic officers or Asian officers or recruits uh, and just make them have the need to try harder, <laughs> right? It's uh, a stealth sort of process of discrimination. And it, we can see it now all the way from the White House, can't we? Some of you may, may agree or don't agree, but we, we see it. It's in the news today. It was in the news yesterday, yesterday, yeah, last year, year before last year. We had this same issue come before us when I was a member of the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, EPA, starting in 2007 to 2010, where people on the uh, Environmental Justice Advisory Council were university professors from Michigan, from California, from other states, who challenged my input and the input of Native Americans and challenged the input of Hispanics and other people who were on these various work groups. We were working uh, to implement a recommendation that was going to the White House called Reducing Air Emissions Associated with Goods Movement, Working Toward Environmental Justice. And it was completed in November of 2009. And I worked on that work group along with some other work groups. But this particular one, some of the professors on it did not want um, my documented input. They didn't want other community document input. And they actually took it out after it was already drafted. So I had to, had, had to write a formal letter to EPA Administrator Lisa Perez Jackson, who was the first person of color for EPA, as the EPA Administrator, uh, to uh, ask her to reinsert uh, as references uh, under the community facilitated section, community facilitated uh, section uh, of this particular recommendation that was written by me. That section was written by me, and she did. And there were f at least four articles that were co-written by some of our colleagues, Dr. Jacoby Wilson, some of you know him, at the University of Maryland College Park now, and some other community people. And they were co-written as a part of a series of articles we did with John Hopkins University School of Public Health. And she reinstated them, and uh, I'm not sure what she said to the people privately, but personally, some of them came to me and apologized for what they had done. But it was CYA. They were just, quote unquote, they thought they were protecting themselves. And they were not all white, by the way, right? And they were not all men. All right, okay, all right. Now, in, uh, we, see, we, received, we received small grants to start doing our research. From uh, Environmental Justice Small Grant from Atlanta, that's EPA's Office of Environmental Justice. Uh, in 2000, $15,000 to start some of our work to officially document some of the stuff we were already doing. We were already doing the work, but it's just, you know what, repetition, uh, you have to be able to duplicate. So we did it for EPA Region 4, 
then they liked it enough and we got a hundred thousand dollar grant in 2004 to do it again for the office of environmental justice uh, at the direct request of charles lee charles lee is the senior most environmental justice advisor and deputy for epa in the whole country right charles lee has spoken in this very room which is the same podium back here in 2014 with the ambassador from ecuador i think right yeah okay memory is pretty good uh so um he was a part of the environmental justice movement that started in North Carolina and Warren County, by the way, with the United Church of Christ almost 40 years ago. So now he's a federal official and we communicate with him on a pretty regular basis. All right. So we developed four principles because they said, well, you're talking about this stuff, man. Write it down. Can you write it down? Can you write what you've been doing? Can you put words to it? And of course, sometimes you have to reduce, reduct, define what you're going to say. So our community owned managed research model. Uh, came out with four principles and uh, that we've been using all along, but we hadn't named them. And the first one was funding equity when you work with universities. Hard to get. Management parity. Sometimes hard to get. <laughs> Your community, but you don't manage a project when you partner with university. They want to run everything. Science for compliance. No, we're just doing it so uh, a student can graduate. No one is just doing it so we can publish a paper. No, we're just doing it for our six weeks project. But we want the information to be used for compliance and enforcement, not just not just uh, um, data. And the fourth one was leverage of legal leverage of research results for compliance and enforcement, uh, whether that's against a, a corporation, whether it's against the city, or et cetera. All right. Uh, Weaver's community-led science model included memorandums of understanding, memorandums of agreement that actually said what you're going to do for us and when you're going to do it, if you're going to do it. And it had, you had to sign a memorandum of agreement in the name of your organization, not just you as an individual. Okay. Uh, there was a group called Community Campus Partnerships who indicated in an article in 2007 that, as illustrated by the Coma model, you must overcome deeply entrenched views and policies that serve to maintain university control of research enterprise. We must build research capacity of community-based organizations. Right. The article was titled, Realizing the Promise of Community-Based Participatory Research. The article also referenced the fact that the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, where a lot of universities get a lot of their research money, get multiples and billions above to research us above EPA, which is designed to protect us. It's, something's wrong with the picture. It's still wrong with the picture. Thirty-seven mil million billion dollars at that time for NIHS, and only seven billion for EPA and a very small amount, a few million of that money at EPA to do corrective action. Right. Now, one of the things that we want to talk about in closing is um, something we want to share with you. Today is the official day we're releasing a press release on the Memorandum of Understanding as a result of our work with the national uh, and international science associations conference that was held in Raleigh, March of 2019 at the Raleigh Convention Center. Uh, Attorney Longus was one of the panel members. The first time they'd ever had a panel on how to leverage compliance by community groups. There were several attorneys there, right? And as a result of that, an environmental justice practitioners work group was formed. And that particular work group included myself, my wife as advisors, and included Antonio uh, Garcia of Milwaukee, uh, who is now in Peru, by the way, and uh, Vincent Martin of Detroit, and Veronica Bidding of Raleigh, and Winston-Salem. She commutes back and forth. She does a whole lot of work. And ourselves. And we decided to formalize the process in more detail and share it. So memorandum of understanding. Brenda has a copy. You want to share it with... Uh, with uh, Share it with Reich and uh, Michelle and Michelle 
and we have uh, we have a few copies of a few more copies that some of the students can get. But in any case, today is official announcement of that press release. It included a press release about what we're, what we're doing here today. It includes the announcement of the memorandum of understanding and memorandum of agreement. And it's already been shared with the national board of the Citizen Science Association. They're already reviewing it. We've had requests from the American Public Health Association's Environmental Justice Work Group for copies of it. To we all, there also is a copy. Uh, we've gotten a request from the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, American Health Public, the American Public Health Association, by the way, has over 25,000 members, and I think it's the oldest public health association in the world. If my information is right, goes all the way back to 1800s. Right, sometimes after the Civil War. They want copies of it. The National Science Foundation want copies of it because they see it as a problem too, but they've been fudging the issue along and talking behind closed doors. The last thing I want to mention to you is we need some changes, some pretty significant changes. And it involves you as students. It involves what you can do, it involves what faculty can do, can do. it involves what can be done on the administrative side for universities to support clinics like this environmental law and policy clinic from above you so you get support to address the issue. These are some of the things that at various conferences all over the country and out of the country, people have said to me, right, describing their relationship. Sometimes they don't say them to the universities, but they refer to the relationship as Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. They refer to them as dead data walking, guinea pig syndrome, pimping pain, devoid of moral value, data hunters and gatherers, white ivory tower privilege, academic slavery, IRB or internal review board ignorant, $25 Walmart card research, etc. These descriptions don't just come from community people, they also come from faculty and students who are involved in the process, but very often they say it quietly, right? But I'm sharing it to you publicly. In closing, Victimized individuals, communities, and indigenous areas have the right to pursue legal action to uh, address these issues, these ongoing issues. In order to address these systematic academic injustices, we need amendments to deinstitutionalize and democratize university research. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll take um, a few questions from the audience. Any questions? Well, yes. I, I wanted to talk a little, ask you to talk a little more about the differences and the advances you see between the evolution from uh, your traditional form of research, community-based participatory research, and now the student all the concept that you talk a little more about the intellectual genesis well, some of, the, some of the files are trained. Uh, Community-based participatory research is something that the EPA adopted and a lot of the universities adopted. But a lot of community groups found out it says participatory, and very often when they write grants, uh, university, they write a grant in partnership, it might be a million dollars, $400,000, whatever it is, and the community groups wind up getting 40, winds up getting 4% uh, of it, or 3%, uh, basically nothing, right? Um, so. Uh, the community-led process developed, and then out of that we developed what is called the community-owned and managed research model, which includes the leverage. But something else came about more recently called citizen science, and that's the conference we were talking about was in Raleigh a few years, uh, uh, last year, uh, 2019. But the discussions at uh, congressional level actually removed the term citizen science from the bill. It was in there about, I think, 12 or 13 times, over a dozen times. And the reason they removed it because the definition of citizen uh, actually uh, diminishes and does not address over 40 million people who are in this country. And uh, they are sometimes doctors, sometimes lawyers, sometimes healthcare workers, sometimes farmers, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, people that you know, 
Sometimes there's students, some people in this room might be covered under that, that are not citizens but are documented or people for study or immigrants uh, for what number of reasons, temporary or permanently. So they took it out and they put in community-based and community-led science instead. And they specifically said that in order to implement the bill, this, the Environmental Justice Act, it was necessary to democratize, institutionalize science. It does not say exclude the relationship or exclude the, the relationship with universities. And it was, it's necessary to do that because it is more likely for people to file complaints and access the law if they're able to do it, if they have the money to do it, if they have the access to do it, if they have the data that universities pull out of them to actually address those issues. So community-led science and community-based science is a term that's in the bill. And that was specifically discussed by a number of attorneys who said that we do not want to use that word citizen because it plays into the current political atmosphere and it excludes just too many people. If you snatch those 40 million people out of the country, probably just about every hotel and restaurant and landscaping company and a whole lot of other things would close. And of course, a lot of you in the class may not be able to be here either. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I, it's been interesting to see the Democratic candidates talking about environmental justice explicitly. Um, is there uh, is there a, a plan or a conversation that you've heard from any of the candidates about environmental justice that stood out to you as kind of more concrete and uh, concrete? Uh, well, the two we've had some contact with, we didn't actually talk to Cory Booker himself, Senator Booker. We talked to his administrative staff many, many times. We're still in communication with them while he was running for president. Um, we did actually meet Tom Sire in Raleigh, uh, my wife and I, and uh, we talk, tried to <laughs> we tried to talk to him. He um, he promotes environmental justice. He promotes climate justice, and we wanted to send him a document that we've shared with Reich and Michelle. They had to do with climate, uh, climate change and the causes of it, a specific kind of case study based on what is happening in Memphis, in our community. And it was requested by Senator Tammy Duckworth from uh, Illinois, right? She's a chair of a committee on environmental justice and climate justice, uh, climate change and environmental justice, right? Uh, but we tried to share that with Tom, and we wanted to mail it to him, and he wouldn't give us his an address so we could send a copy to him, a document to him. So uh, I don't question his sincerity, right? But some of the people have uh, a very protective methodology where they think, I'm going to tell you I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do it wonderfully. President candidates, political candidates have a tendency to do this. But when you say you will offer some real information to them about your history and background that's longer than their history and background, they push back and say, I got it. I got it. I don't need your help. That's basically what his attitude was. So we know that the Democratic candidates know about the talking points, but do they actually know about the details on the ground? By the way, for your information, all of the senators who were running for president, by the way, all of them, the ones who dropped out and the ones that are still there, Bernie Sanders, Warren, Kamala Harris, Senator Booker, um, Klobuchar, all of them have signed on in support of, of the Environmental Justice Act even though they're fussing and fighting on stage because they want to be president. It's, it's interesting about the political process. So some of them, they have signed on, and there's a committee of 16 people who have signed on the climate justice and environmental justice, 16 senators from all over the country. But if you sit down and talk to each one of them individually about how much they actually know that they can talk about, then it becomes difficult. And that's one reason we're being called back often to share information uh, about this part, edit this, what do you think about this title, that kind of thing. It's, it's pretty interesting chore from a community point of view, but I guess we have to say we're blessed to be able to garner that level of respect <laughs> right? that we continue to get emails and sometimes phone calls uh, from them. It is a growth process, and the information we sent to, to Reich and Michelle on the request from this, this senatorial committee with Tammy Duckworth is pretty extensive and it has a lot of attachments. So a lot of people do not expect that because we got a call and we talk to the people. 
who asked for the information, they were kind of like, wow, you guys have been working. And the person who was a federal policy advisor for Duckworth was a relatively young person. So we have been doing what we've been doing for a while. And uh, this, some of the policy advisors who advise the candidates and give them the information put on their desk, they're not totally informed themselves. No mechanism of accountability to hear um, what the community experience was, and because of that lack of um, um, accountability mechanisms, um, departments like mine are able to continue to uh, report community after community. Um, so my question is: Have you, in your experience, come across any like rubrics or like any communication mechanisms that um, different communities can have with each other? Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, there are <laughs> there are some instances where you have to find a friend in your department that supports you, right? Some of the students we work with at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill when we did research work, uh, some of the faculty members came to bat when they came to work with us and for six weeks and they didn't want to leave because they said they were learning more from us than they were learning in their class. Some students were challenged to leave us, and they actually had to change their advisors because the advisors were threatening them for continuing to work with us. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty tough. So we had some faculty members who were friends of theirs and friends of ours who actually went to bat for them. Because you probably know it's pretty tough to get an advisor that is stymieing you based on what you just said, removed. But we actually were involved in situations like that. Right? So how uh, it is done and how it's documented is some of that is included from the community side in the memorandum of understanding that you have. You got a copy of it, right? Okay. And we're addressing it that we encourage community groups to document and file reports about their relationship rather than coming to me or somebody else and complaining and doing the name calling list that I gave you and, and giving these the right, put it down, put it on paper and uh, respond to it. That's one. This discussion with the MOA is only a template to encourage other colleges and universities to start talking about and discussing it in a big forum. School of Engineering, School of Law, School of Epidemiology, all these different schools of medicine, all these different schools have started addressing it. And how you can report what you think as a student is an infraction or not necessarily uh, keeping the guidelines straight without being threatened like some of the students that work with us, right? And in, in, in case of community groups, how they can file complaints. In our case, we went to the Department of Justice. We went, it took us four years because nobody was paying attention to us. Universities weren't paying, city, county, local lawyers. So everything changed when we filed a complaint in the United States Department of Justice. 
Department of Justice said it's very rare that a community group like ours would ever do something like that. It was, it was pretty doggone unusual that we took it to that level, but it actually changed the dynamics of some of the stuff we're working with. How you develop a website on it, that's a, or a dashboard, as some people call it, is something we're discussing with some people from EPA. We're also discussing that with the American Public Health Association. Uh, some of the leaders there, like Charles Lee, we're discussing with them right now for how you make it available so people know. It's not to destroy a university or stop a university, but people need to be held accountable because the basic line is that the university received federal appropriations in the billions of dollars, and we expect that those appropriations be uh, accountable and transparent as to how they're used and fairly treated for the communities they work with as well as students. Does that help? All right, then. And we have time for one last question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have more to say, and I hope you have more time. Uh, I, can you speak a little bit louder? Okay, we, we have been, have some inroads with the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality, DEQ, right, some of you call it DEQ. Uh, that's Secretary Reagan's office, and one of the people we've been working with is a person by the name of um, Renee Kramer. She's a relatively new person in charge of Title VI and uh, the Environmental Justice uh, Task Force, right? Uh, we have communicated with her on various occasions. She was, at, oops, she was at our Western Revivals Association dinner this past November. Uh, Michelle was there at that dinner, and Wright was there the year before last. And uh, one of the things we have, you know, off the record, so to speak, I'll share with you is that one of the challenges she has in making things work with in implementing new laws and new regulations as far as environmental justice is concerned is the state legislature. The state legislature has defunded positions in DEQ related to this. The state legislature has put barriers between the Department of Environmental Quality working with the Department of Transportation, working with the Department of Health, because it's an interagency issue, and it can be dealt with with one agency, right? Uh, we have had a meeting in Mebane with, with Michael, with Michael, Secretary Reagan, right? Some of the things didn't go quite what we expected because the political barriers are so big, considering the, the structure and the personality of the North Carolina State Legislature in the House as well as in the Senate. So there's a lot of pushback each time this issue comes up. We've also attempted to get some of the African American people who are part of the Legislative Caucus, Black Legislative Caucus, involved in environmental justice training. Some of them are interested, some of them are promised, but we found out some of them still push back because there's this whole question of getting reelected and where you get your money from. So if certain kind of tags get attached to you then certain monies won't come in. There are commercials on TV, by the way, uh, that are paid for by the Republican Party supporting Erica Smith. <laughs> and we've talked to her more than once about this issue. Uh, and it identifies her as a climate justice and environmental justice uh, promoter. Um, and also there are commercials owned by her um, opponent, Democratic opponent, Cal Cunningham. There are three others that nobody talks about. <laughs> uh, we've met with both of them face-to-face, -face, right? Uh, Cal Cunningham made it very clear that he would support the environmental justice bill if he's elected, right? So you've seen the commercials on TV. So um, it is just, the politics are politics, and sometimes it gets in the way of getting anything done. So the politics that we have right now, some people expect when the election takes place in the fall, there'll be more blue. Uh, maybe some will be Duke blue. <laughs> or Carolina blue, whichever the case, in the state legislature to uh, drive a more positive uh, attitude toward these issues and get even more people of color who are elected, who are already in office, to step out and stop being uh, afraid to uh, be labeled as an environmental justice <laughs> promoter. So that's some of the stuff we've dealt battle with at the state level. And this conversation, by the way, is going on in states all over the country. My phone is blowing up over the last three days from people from all over the country who are supporters of the environmental justice bill, who are struggling with the same thing. 
in their state, in New Mexico, in California, in Connecticut, in Massachusetts, in Maryland, uh, in Texas, uh, South Carolina, other states are part of the team who advise on the bill. Some of them are becoming very frustrated with what's, ha what's happening at that state legislative level. Some of them think things are going to change with the election. Some of them think things are not going to change. So even if things happen good at the national level, getting it implemented at the state level and the local level still will be a channel just like the Civil Rights Act. All right, then. And thank you. Um, you all have been a great audience. Um, I'm going to sneak in really quickly um, a question. And my question is in relation to, do you have any advice to give to students as far as coalition building? Because a lot of the work that West End Revitalization Association has done has been connecting community groups to be able to work together to move forward. So advice in that. And then also, can you share with the students a takeaway that you want them to have at the end of this talk? Uh, first takeaway is something I talked to Brandon about, Brandon Hunter is uh, some of you are looking at career paths connected is some of you are looking at this as an academic responsibility for this class and probably this class only, maybe, right? But one of the things I talked to Brandon about earlier before we came in here is that if you're picking a place for your career and you're very interested, this is part of your heart, if you want to make it part of your career, you want to be careful about where you pick. You want to pick a place where you know that there's a partner or a friend already in that institution. Right. You may bring the environmental consciousness or the climate consciousness as a younger person, but you may run into institutional barriers in that particular government agency or university or whatever it is or job or corporation that you may work for. <laughs> so you can do some pretty significant web searching for any corporation or any business now and click on the search bar and put in there climate justice, climate change, environmental justice, civil rights to see what comes up. Some of these corporations have departments already working on this. Some of them may be Facebook, I mean, you know, only face only, maybe smoke and mirrors, but some of them are pretty serious. Then you can Google down and find out who's in those organizations that you can contact and talk to them, not just paperwork. Talk to them and find out how real they are, right? Before, that's one. The other one is if you're involved in other community organizations, sororities, fraternities, you can share that information and see if there are partners in there. We're working with churches, one in Durham on Austin Avenue, right behind North Carolina Central University. We're working with churches in Winston-Salem. These are pretty significantly sized historic African-American churches where pastors are bringing us in and saying, will you help us understand this? Because it's pretty complicated. And it's not just a one-shot workshop. It's a continuing thing. So we're doing that too. And you find people who may be interested in environmental justice as it relates to housing only. They may not be interested in anything else, but that's an open door to other things. Some of them want to talk about the environmental justice as it relates to the health part of it, right? So whatever door they want to let you in to discuss it with them, take it. You know, because it, it, this is pretty, this is a big load of information and don't expect 25 years of absorbing all this stuff. Plus, all of our lives is following civil rights stuff. We're 70 years old, so there's no way in the world you can uh, transfer, decipher, or uh, uh, encourage other people who don't know what in the world you're talking about. Uh, so those avenues, I think, are pretty important. Your social group, your professional group. Ask if you get on a panel or raise it as a part of your meeting, your minutes, to say, are you interested? Do you know anything about it? Do you want to do anything with it? Uh, can I help? You might get more work than you, than you expect if you're the only person in the group. So you, you'll probably find some people who may be very interested in knowing, because now it's on the national agenda with the presidential candidates talking about it. That makes a big difference. Right. Thank you. So everyone, let's give Omega Wilson and Brenda Wilson a round of applause. Thank you for coming down today.